Thanks everyone. We're gonna get started for today. I'm excited to introduce our topic, which is the evaluation and optimization of right ventricular and lung imaging using high frequency ultrasound. And our speaker today is Allison Rogers, researcher from University of Wisconsin Cardiovascular Research Core Lab. A few notes about today's webinar before we get started. We will be recording today's webinar and we will make it available as soon as possible a couple days after our live event today. All lines are muted for the duration of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom panel at any point throughout the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of our session. And we do expect uh, the presentation to be about 20 minutes, leaving us a nice five to 10 minutes for questions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Allison Rogers completed her BA at Roger Williams University in 2012 in marine bi biology. She then began her career in, in animal husbandry, working with and training exotic species, including cetaceans and pinnipeds. Her work at the University of Wisconsin Cardiovascular Research Core Lab facility primarily for, focuses on providing researchers with non-invasive imaging. Rogers is also instrumental in project management and logistics, large animal surgery, and data analysis and manipulation. Without further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Allison Rogers. All right. Hello, everyone. I am here to talk to you today about the evaluation and optimization of right ventricular and lung imaging using high frequency ultrasound. Just to give you a little overview of the presentation today, I'm first going to talk about the value evaluating the right heart and then actually how to go about acquiring and analyzing those images that you collect from the right ventricle. In addition to some tips and tricks on how to get your images, since we all know it can be a little bit complicated, and then do a brief intro on the technique for some basic pulmonary imaging. We can see a pretty picture here of our right ventricle, and hopefully we can teach you on how to gather that. All right. Um, as many of you are probably already aware, chronic right heart failure has numerous impacts on one's health. It's associated with decreased ex exercise tolerance, poor functional capacity, a decreased cardiac output, progressive end or organ damage, and as well as some a systemic pro-inflammatory state. So because of that, right heart failure may be the ultimate cause of death in patients with acute or chronic pulmonary hypertension. And so we really need to be able to detect any sort of right heart dysfunction or right ventricle dysfunction in order to have a better idea of how pulmonary vascular diseases progress. To start with how we wanna go and acquire that, it's important to first have an understanding of the obstacles that we have to overcome it's difficult traditionally to gather the images from the right heart because of the complex ventricular shape, the interference you have from the lungs, and just how the heart is positioned in the chest. It can kind of narrow our odds of getting a good acoustic window. So the first way that you can help yourself and set yourself up for success is to position your mouse correctly. And as you'll notice in this center image, um, if you have the probe to the animal's right and tip the animal all the way to its left, you're the best, you're giving yourself the best um, setup in order to really be able to view just the left heart, not get too much lung uh, left interference and eliminate some of your lung interference that you're going to get upon respiration. It's important that you acquire a couple different modes when you're looking at the right heart. It's not just gonna be a traditional MO like you would maybe get for your left heart. I suggest you obviously get that M mode so you can make your measurements from there, but additionally acquire some B modes. These B modes are really good to reference back to. They kind of give you an understanding of what's going on in the whole heart and in the mouse itself without just kind of having that narrower window, the smaller B mode at the top of your M. This also allows you to have a good reference back if you want to know how your M mode was positioned in relation to the whole right ventricle. Gives you an understanding of if you were too high, too basal, or too apical within your kind of like window that you set that M mode at. And it kind of lets you know 
whether or not you positioned it there because it was your only option or because that's what the mouse would, that's the only, that was the best kind of reading spot, gave you the brightest walls. In addition to that M and B mode of your right ventricle, you should also collect the pulse wave, the Doppler function of your pulmonary artery and a B mode. The B mode will be important later for understanding diameter when you're able to get the diameter of the pulmonary artery and the velocities going through, you are able to back calculate flow, which can give you a very good understanding of right heart function. So I wanna first start and talk about some of the data that my lab was able to collect using these right ventricular echoes. We started with a study in rats and we were able to induce pulmonary arterial hypertension in adult rats with Sujin hypoxia and then treated these rats with MSCs delivered by either IV, IM or epicardial placement of a bioscaffold that was seeded with the MSCs. And then we examined each of these treatments for efficacy. The animals were evaluated for function at three different time points. They were evaluated at baseline, so week zero, after the PAH development, which is about week six, and three weeks after that, which was um, after the treatment, sorry, which was at about week nine. And our echo data was actually able to demonstrate the beneficial effects of the localized MSC delivery to a failing RV with the novel bioscaffold. And we were able to determine that the restoration of the stroke volume and the cardiac output was a good indicator overall of a global improvement of the right ventricle. And <clears throat> this was all able to, you can see our measurements here at the bottom, the right ventricular internal diameters. We also measured TAPSI and fractional shortening, but these right ventricular di diameters are a good reference point back, especially if you're doing a longitudinal study you want to be able to know, use your own animals as your controls. And these internal diameters will be important if you want to ever calculate ejection or um, yeah, ejection fraction. Another study that we participated in was one where there was a genetic knockout and that knockouts developed a diaphragm malformation similar to those found in a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Traditionally, these mice are too fragile to measure the RV pressures directly. They just are too small. They're only about eight to 10 grams at the most. And they can't take a pressure volume catheter for PV loops. So we actually used ECHO to estimate the pulmonary vascular resistance, the PVR, by calculating the ratio of the pulmonary artery acceleration time to the pulmonary artery ejection time. And you can see some how that calculation or the, where those measurements are taken here. If you have the pulse wave function on with the Doppler mode in your visual sonics machine, it'll give you that nice classic arterial waveform. And if you measure this acceleration time and the ejection time, which would just be ta a time measurement from here, from the start of the waveform to the end, you can calculate that pulmonary vascular resistance, which are both very easy measurements to take and their measurements that Visual Sonics already puts into the measurement table. So you don't need to try to use something blank. Um, these measurements, we found <clears throat> that the control mice had the expected reduction of the pulmonary vascular resistance after birth, while the knockouts had a gradual decline, as you can see after about time point three. And this suggests that the pulmonary arterial pressure did not decrease normally as it should, and that it was decreasing and that the, um, the right heart would actually probably start to worsen the function of it over time with age instead of, <clears throat> instead of the, sorry, the pressures here, instead of being able to have them increase the animals, we're just basically slowly going into right heart failure. And the data suggested that this smooth muscle contraction after birth significantly changes that ratio and is probably the primary contributor to lethal pulmonary hypertension in these mutants. So some tips and tricks to actually collecting these images. I always suggest starting with a sick animal. 
it seems silly, but a stick animal is going to have that really nice dilated RV. And so if you know that your animal has some sort of right heart dysfunction or pulmonary dysfunction that could lead to some right heart, um, of heart right heart phenotype, you want to try to image that animal first. The bigger your right heart is, the obviously the easier it is going to be to see in a traditional, like healthy control, black six animal, you're going to get a, an RV that really hugs that left ventricle. So it's going to be really difficult to see your free wall and see your internal, internal chamber with confidence. When you have a sick animal, it's nice and dilated. It gives you an easier target. I also suggest always taking B modes for reference. These will not necessarily be anything that you would measure from and get quantitative data, but this allows you to have something that gives you more information about right heart function when you're going to make those measurements. It lets you understand maybe why you took certain images where, and it lets you know, gives you a good set of landmarks to look for when you do drop those B modes and you're looking, or you're looking at diameters. If you're trying to be consistent over a study, these B modes will give you kind of good starting points to jump off from. And additionally, when you go, don't go to take your M modes, take as many as you can without being excessive. The M modes are going to be really important to be in a consistent location throughout your study and from animal to animal. So it's always going to be easier to collect those M modes more basal just because the outflow track is giving you a bigger target. It's a bigger space and it's just a better photoacoustic window to see. When you get down to the apex, the RV starts to really hug the left and it gets very small. It's hard to see. So start with your M modes, take a bunch of them, but start high and then work your way down until you just don't get anything that you could confidently measure from. And then as you kind of go through your study, you are gonna have a lot of images to sort through. You're gonna to have to find some, so you're getting a consistent location from animal to animal throughout the study, but it does give you a lot of options. It's a little bit more tedious on the back end, but it will be great for accuracy. Additionally, like I've mentioned, take your PA dam diameters from your B modes wherever you take your velocity. So if you collect that velocity, you get a great waveform. You like who you what you're seeing. You're they're nice and high or whatever you're kind of hoping to see. Immediately just switch to your B mode and collect an image there. And that way you have the exact spot where you collected your velocities and your flow calculations will be more accurate. Those calculations can be finicky because you are taking the square root at some point for the cross-sectional area. So the more accurate, the better, and it won't um, exponentially get more, get off of where you are in the diameter. Now to start, one of the other things that you're gonna see when you start imaging the right heart is a lot of lung. You're gonna probably see a bunch of what you're seeing here in this image. <clears throat> Traditionally, we might've thrown something like that away and been super frustrated because it just looks kind of like a gray mess of echogenic lines. But thanks to Jana Grun, who actually did a webinar on this on the Visual Sonics platform last May in 2020, we can actually now use this lung data to assess pulmonary function. So <clears throat> you can reference her webinar to get a more in-depth um, idea of what's going on here. But another researcher, she also, uh, Maria Vialba Arrero, also created a lung ultrasound scoring. And she allowed us to use all of these artifacts we see here to kind of give us a more quantitative approach. It's still all kind of subjective to the viewer but it does assign numbers to each profile. So we can create something that you could see change, a scoring that you could see change over time if you had an animal that you were applying a treatment to. But really it just allows us to assess something that we normally would have just considered artifact and be able to get actual quantifiable data from how well this animal is doing with its pulmonary function. Some of the profiles that I really like in the lung ultrasound score, um, there's something called sliding, which is basically the movement of the pleural horizontally with respirations. The stiffer, the stickier the pleural get, that sliding becomes less. Um, something she calls profile, which is basically a category of all these lines that we're seeing coming off the pleura. 
and <clears throat> how those are produced by the air artifact. There's also echo color, which is, you know, you basically your overall gain settings. Um, but you want to, if you keep your gain consistent, the coloring of the echo itself can change over time, as well as whether or not you're looking for short echogenic lines coming right off the pleura. Those are the, the couple different ultrasound scoring sections that she focuses on that we've seen change in studies that we know have pulmonary effects. Some of the other ones are a little bit harder, but these ones become more obvious if you have sick animals versus your controls. Some tips to actually intentionally collecting these pulmonary images is in the beginning, take multiple BMON images. Ideally take them and also apply yourself some directional motion. This will help you get an understanding of lung condition, but it also gives you some more landmarks, especially when you have things like you can start to see the aorta if you go to towards the head and if you go um, further south, you're going to start to run into liver and those two tech, those two landmarks are really good just kind of give you an idea of where you are in the chest, just because overall the lungs don't give you any landmarks like the heart does. You also want to be sure that you keep your TGC same through the same throughout every study if possible, or at least through what you can grow through each study. The TGCs will affect the echo profile, the coloring of your, your lung ultrasounds. And if you set them too high, it will artificially whitewash them. And if they're too low, you're gonna get them to be too dark. And it could make you feel as though your animal is doing either healthier if they're dark or worse if they're brighter than they actually are. So overall, right ventricular echoes are not just important, but they can actually provide you with sensitive and valuable data. They are hard to collect, but once you collect that data, it is sensitive enough to provide you with valuable information into your right heart function. And although we used to curse the lungs interfering in our right heart echoes, there is now a silver lining and we can actually gather lung ultrasound data that does give us an idea about pulmonary function. And that's it, short and sweet. Great, thank you so much. Allison, that was an excellent presentation and I think some really useful tips and tricks for everyone in, in the audience here. So I'm going to get started with some that have uh, been piling in here. So it starts with a compliment saying awesome presentation. Um, and this individual is looking if there are any other resources you would recommend to a student interested in right heart imaging. Yeah, right heart imaging, right heart data is hard to find, especially if you're looking for it exclusively without pulmonary information. But because the right heart and the pulmonary system are so closely tied, if you're not finding the information that you want for the right heart, I definitely recommend looking in pulmonary data. They'll always kind of coincide. So if someone's done information on pulmonary and the pulmonary function, they will have right heart data in there. Great. So the next question is, have you done any imaging in a pulmonary banding uh, situation? We have, that's actually, aside from the Sujin hypoxia, that's a very popular model that we've done. And you will get right heart function or right heart dysfunction when you do ban those animals. And they make, it actually makes it really good to collect images when you get that super dilated right heart. One of the things I will suggest, if you are gonna do pulmonary banding in your animals, don't only get the velocities and the diameters of your pulmonary artery before the band to make sure you get it after your band. Ideally, immediately after, that's where you're going to see the highest jet of the blood flow through the band. But if you get the before and after and you have the velocities and ideally the diameters of both, you can actually start to get the, the change in the gradient through the band. So it just gives you a better idea of how tightly your band was and um, what level of kind of dysfunction you're providing to that right heart. That's great. Thank you. And the, the next question is, do you have any experience with rat RV imaging? And if so, how does that compare with mouse? Absolutely. So the study that I showed you with the Sujin hypoxia animals, those are actually rats. And we've found, unlike some other imaging and other um, even ultrasounding that you're trying to do with the rodents, there's really not a big difference between mice and rats for the right heart. It's 
easier in, you know, a smaller animal, but in just because the principles of ultrasound. And so rats can be more difficult than mice, but I haven't noticed as much of a difference in imaging right heart between mice and rats as I have with the left. Great. So we're going to take one more question, but I'd like to remind everyone, encourage them, please put your questions in and we will follow up with, uh, with you after, and we can connect you with Allison to answer your questions afterwards as well. So our last question for today is, have you used LV eccentricity index and short access to evaluate RV enlargement and septal bowing? Yeah, so we haven't done too much of that, but we have tried to quantitate septal bowing in a four chamber mode we didn't kind of apply anything very tricky or complicated to it. We just kind of took a four chamber and on a scale of like one to three from, you know, one, there was absolutely no bowing to three, there was a ton and it was, you know, basically totally interfering with the other ventricle. We didn't get more complicated than that. We didn't see any other correlations that kind of indicated that we should, but it is possible that you can do that from four chamber. Great. Thank you so much. So at this point in time, I, I want to thank Allison so much for your presentation. That was great. We really got a lot of engagement. And again, we will follow up with everyone whose question was not answered. And uh, thank you to everyone for attending and, and your engagement. We love to see everyone uh, participate and uh, put in questions for our speakers. So before we finish out for today, I just want to encourage you all to connect with us on our website. If you did have any follow-up questions or needed some more tips or advice on right ventricular imaging, you can contact us through our web support forms on our website. Uh, you can also look for future webinars or connect with us on any of our social media channels. And I wanted to highlight our next upcoming live webinar, which is being presented by Dr. Pierre Sicard, and uh, he'll be talking about synchronous tracking of oxygen saturation and vital organs, the effects beyond heart failure. So I encourage you to please uh, register for that. We're putting the link inside the chat right now. And that webinar is being held on June 10th at 10 a.m. Eastern. And I and in case anyone is, is not aware, we do have a training video portal called the Learning Hub, and you can uh, get some more information about what training videos are available by going to our website. And with that, I want to thank you all so much, and I hope uh, to see you next time.